Hi, I'm Simon K. Jones, and you're listening to the audio version of Tales from the Triverse, my ongoing science fiction, fantasy, detective, serial thing. Okay, today we have a bonus chapter going by the name of Ellen Brin's Monster Compendium. Previously, a crack monster hunting crew roamed the badlands of Palinor far beyond the safety of city walls, tracking down dangerous beasts that threaten settlements in exchange for coin. They survive as soldiers of fortune. If you have a problem, if no one else can help, and if you can find them, maybe you can hire the Six Blades. What follows is a transcript from Ellen Brin's notes on dangerous flora and fauna. Keeping this updated while on the road is an ongoing challenge, and Gark keeps teasing me for spending so much time scribbling and sketching. Maybe they'll appreciate it when something I wrote in this book saves their ass. Keng To Beast I've been meaning to add an entry on the Keng To for a while. We'd heard tales of evolved Keng Tos, but had never actually had to deal with one until the London job. Ordinarily, they're carefully farmed and culled before reaching stage four. The entire strategy with a wild kengto is to deal with it in its larval state or in one of its earlier forms. Leaving it too late significantly increases the difficulty. The beast's unique physiology is rapidly adaptive to its surroundings, so strategies for neutralising it will depend entirely on which stage it is at. All kengto have their own quirks, but commonly observed stages include larval, small grub approximately the size of a human forearm, Still dangerous due to toxic residues, but a swift axe chop will solve the problem. Canine-sized reptile. The next stage becomes immediately more deadly, gaining legs, jaws, and startling mobility. Still relatively small, the size of a typical household dog, but any bite or claw swipe is fatal within minutes without treatment. Horse-sized, with growing intelligence. Now with six legs and significantly increased strength, the Keng To is a formidable physical opponent. Some are more pony-sized, but just as difficult to handle. The Keng To's quills are now fully developed, laced with toxins and able to fire them as projectiles. Apparently this is when their meat is tastiest and most tender, though if not prepared properly it will poison an entire wedding party. You're not going to catch me putting it in my mouth. Sub-Dragon At this stage the Keng To is as large as a boat or caravan, its middle legs cease to function and begin morphing into what will become wings. At this stage, the middle legs are mostly useless and in a semi-raised position. Mammoth-sized. Now the size of a small building, and membranes are visible stretching between the joints of the middle legs. Despite its size, the Keng To's powerful remaining legs and uniquely clawed feet enable it to climb almost any surface. Dragon-sized. Now larger than most native fauna, the Keng To's wings become operative at this stage. With new aerial mobility, the Keng To becomes a city-level threat. However, it is primarily restricted to gliding rather than directed flight. Kibro-sized. Now capable of full flight and twice the height of a three-storey building. At this stage, you're basically screwed, save for a complete military response. From the canine scale beast upward, the Keng To properly hates loud noises. Resonant frequencies should be used to disorient it, uh, then focus should be on disabling the wings if present. The Kengto will continue fighting until it's beheaded regardless of injuries. It goes without saying that quill antidotes should be prepared and imbibed prior to battle. And Gark would like me to note here that Kengtos are ugly sons of bitches. There, I've made the note. Flitters. Much like the problem that anyone who chooses to pick a fight with me encounters, the biggest challenge when up against flitters is to not be distracted by their startlingly attractive appearance. A single flitter is harmless. The size of a butterfly, a flitter is a four-winged insect with a natural affinity for magic. This manifests as a hyper-local teleportation ability, hence the name flitter. At night, a flitter can be spotted by the blue energy pockets left behind as it teleports through the air. Eric informs me that flitters have been central to portal research, in an attempt to understand and recreate the experiment that led to the joining in the year 3000. Problems arise when flitters swarm. Sometimes up to 1,000 strong, a swarm can be devastating as each of the flitters activates their local teleportation repeatedly. An entire field of crops can be decimated in seconds 
a building's core structure can be undermined. If a swarm engulfs a living creature, it will take chunks off it with each teleportation blip, removing limbs and stripping down to the bone in under a minute. It's not nice. It's unknown whether this is deliberate aggressive behaviour or just a side effect of the flitter's natural life cycle. It's not really a consideration when encountering a swarm. The priority then is to run. It's almost impossible to destroy a swarm of flitters without direct support from a skilled magic wielder, who will need to suppress their teleportation instinct or hold them in place. Once contained, it's a fairly trivial matter of incinerating the swarm. Vainka. These were thought extinct for over a century, to the point that they'd become a cautionary tale to tell children. On the one hand, you had humans making Vainka the ultimate bogeyman, coming to take you away in the night and suck your blood. On the other, Ainfar parents would make the plight of the Vainka a morality tale about the corrupting desire for power. Everybody knows that Ainfar can't wield magic, even if nobody's entirely sure why. Much like humans from Mid-Earth or Max-Earth are unable to gain wielding abilities, Ainfa are also in the same way physiologically somehow blocked. The leading explanation for the non palanese humans is to do with dimensional frequencies being incompatible, which would also explain why wielders from Palinor are unable to tap into their abilities after transiting the other way through the portal to Mid-Earth. It's all a bit beyond my skill set. This theory has, of course, been extended to Ain Fa, with some notable academics suggesting that the entire Ain Fa species are from another dimension altogether, stranded on Palinor at some point in the long-distant past. There's a certain logic to that, but fuck those guys, because we all know what they're really saying. The coded message is that Ain Fa don't belong on Palinor, that we're somehow intruders, that we don't deserve magic or agency or the same rights afforded to others. It's a way to use pseudo-history and science to justify the ongoing genocide of our people and shut us out of power. Anyway, Venka were a tribe of Ain Fa that emerged from the far southeast. Their unique capability is to extract magic forcibly from others, draining and absorbing it. This gives Venka the ability to wield magic, but only temporarily. The need to draw from other beings grows over time, so they have to find an increasing number of victims to maintain their abilities. A quirk of Venka is that they can spread their ability to others through breeding or transfusion. For a time they spread across the continent, but the history books tell of their advance being halted and their entire kind being wiped out. They were thought extinct until rumours of Venka sightings began a year or two back. We've never encountered one, yet. Perhaps if we ever have a job that takes us within spitting distance of Lairn, we can have a look around. Every time I mention it, though, how bad shuts me down. Doesn't want to discuss it. Oh well. Little is known these days about how to deal with the Venka. After they were assumed extinct, they were also purged from records. I suppose those in power didn't like Ainfa getting ideas. If we ever encounter one, we'll need to develop strategies on the fly, but I'm pretty certain they'll include Don't Get Bitten. Sclerashog Undead. These are a real oddity. Originally the creation of an ambitious and short-sighted mage, the undead of Sclerashog came to be as a result of reanimation experiments. Raised from the dead but very much not alive, these creatures did not function independently of some pretty serious spells. The mage thought he had control over them for that reason, but an aspect he hadn't entirely considered was their inherent carnal requirements. The Sclerashog undead had no need for food, water, or sleep, but they did like to have a lot of sex. Turns out the offspring of reanimated corpses gain a closer approximation of actual life. Those children developed rapidly and independently of the mage's control, ultimately turning on him. The undead horde continues to grow in number, but keeps largely to itself, shuffling about on the far side of the steps. Still, if they ever decided to visit civilization, we'd all be in a lot of trouble. They are remarkably hardy, capable of continuing to fight even when injured to a level that would kill anything else. The removal of the head is necessary to stop one. Alone they're fairly slow and can be dealt with, but in large numbers would definitely be problematic. The Mur of the Tortaro Usually keeping to themselves, the Mur people off the coast of Tortaro have been known to make landfall. On such occasions, violence tends to ensue. The Mur have a latent ability to wield magic in the form of micrology, though they don't do it in a conscious way or by weaving spells. Instead, it's through their voice and song, 
which has a manipulative effect on the simple-minded, or the horny, luring them into the water to their doom. There is an unusual range of myrrh physiology, which affects the balance of the individual's appearance and abilities. Some are almost entirely fish-like, resembling elongated dolphins more than anything else, and more attuned to water breathing. Those are rarely seen near the coastline. Then there are the myrrh who could almost pass as human, or ain't fur, possessing legs and arms and mammal-like features. Most myrrh exist somewhere in between, perhaps half-half with a fish tail, but a human torso, or vice versa. Some reports talk of even wilder combinations, such as a half mer, half cough, but I've never seen actual evidence of that. They're a highly adaptable species, no matter how you look at it. There are two rules when dealing with an unruly mer: Never fight them in water, and always remember your earplugs. Coth Prime When a coth hive reaches a certain maturity, there arises the potential for a coth prime to emerge. If you encounter one, run. That was the advice Ungark gave me. Fortunately, they rarely venture from the hive, instead staying to defend it from all threats. This means you're unlikely to ever cross paths with a Koth Prime unless you're past the Apalan wastes and messing about in their territory. Koth don't tend to live in hives in the same way when settling in city-states, which means there's no potential for a Koth Prime to manifest. My understanding is that the individual doesn't have any choice over the matter, it being a purely biological impulse. The increased size and strength comes with it a cost of drastically shortened lifespan. Even without direct conflict, a Koth Prime will usually only live for another 10 years, regardless of how old they were at the point of turning. Dopeur. These give even me the creeps. You know what they call a group of Dopeur? A field. I thought that was a joke when I first heard it, but it's true. These are the hyper-aggressive rugs of the northern steppes. Slow and seemingly harmless, they hunt via stealth, lying in wait for an unsuspecting traveller to walk into what looks like a lush field of grasses. Once you enter a dopeur field, you don't come out again. They hunt in packs and specialise in surrounding their prey before they've even been noticed. There's a reason the locals don't ever camp outside in the wild up there. Dealing with dopeur is all about not getting close. You want to use fire or other elemental attacks to take them out from afar. Typical weapons won't do much, though. Total disintegration is required, or they'll just keep going, like a clump of grass chopped into two. And above all, don't get surrounded. In fact, it's best not to take on Dopur unless you're able to get airborne. Durgon. Highly unusual, this is a dual symbiote monomind creature, which translates to two bodies, one brain. The two parts of a Durgon are able to operate individually, but have complete operational awareness of each other. This makes them superb hunters, and it is almost impossible to sneak up on a Durgan, because one can always watch out for the other. Feathered with short limbs, the Durgan isn't able to properly fly, but damn can it scuttle. It's also a professional tunneler, able to dig through solid rock at a ridiculous pace. They will often try to confuse both prey and attackers by acting as two separate creatures and splitting a party or herd. Also referred to as a southern sea dragon, even though they're rarely seen in the water. You probably have seen them in countless paintings from the east, though. Deeply poisonous, so prepare ahead of time. Taking them down can be tricky due to their mobility and shared awareness, but that monomind is also their greatest weakness. Injure one of the bodies, and the other feels it just as acutely. An effective tactic can be to immobilise one, enabling you to focus on the other. OK, I'll add some more updates the next time we make camp. Thanks for listening. You can leave comments and get some behind-the-scenes notes if you head over to the newsletter at simonkjones.substack.com. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time.